Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Somebody's great. I heard that great. Yep, glad that you're with us. Special welcome to those of you who have joined us online. We're glad that you're with us as well. So it was earlier this year, it was, it was in the winter time, and I was at Metro Market, had just checked out, I had a couple bags of groceries, and I was walking out the door, and I was in their little like entryway, just about to walk out of the sliding glass doors, and this guy jumps in front of me, he's got a nice dress shirt on, a tie, and a clipboard, and he goes, excuse me, sir, how satisfied are you with your home internet? <laughs> now, this totally caught me off guard. And he starts in like peppering me with questions like how many devices do we have at home? You know, what kind of usage do we do with our, like the things we do with our internet? And I'm like, what is going on? And then he goes, and how much do you pay? Now, I tell him how much we pay and he goes, oh, what if I could cut that in half for you? And like our internet's a reasonable bill. I mean, it's not super high, but the way he responded, you would have thought like we were just shoveling money in a furnace or something. And I start to tell him like, you know, like I appreciate what you're doing. Like we're really fine. We're content with our internet. I'm like, I gotta get going. I gotta go home and make my kids dinner, but I appreciate what you're doing. Now, like any good salesman, he tries to keep the conversation going. He's asking questions. Oh, do you mind if I ask you how many kids you have? And I, and I think what he's doing is thinking like more kids equals more smartphones and laptops, more devices, which slows your internet. And I'm like, really, I, I appreciate what you're doing, but I'm content with my internet. And he goes, what do you do for work? Probably thinking like, oh, you know, you work from home and is that satisfy, you know, with what your, what your workload is? And I didn't tell him what I did. Did, but I should have and be like, let me pray for you. <laughs> and that probably would have ended the conversation right there. But he keeps asking questions and eventually I just say, look, I'm really satisfied with my home internet. Thank you so much. And I just walk away. Now a week goes by and I'm walking into Metro Market this time. And as I walk through those same doors, a woman in like a, a nice skirt and blouse pops in front of me with a clip forward and says, excuse me, sir, how satisfied are you with your home internet? And I was like, look, I talked to your buddy last week. I'm really okay with my internet. Appreciate what you guys are doing. And I just went into the store. So another week goes by and my radar is up. Like I'm looking for the spectrum people. I'm like, where are they? They're going to pop out of some aisle. They're going to be in the produce section by the avocados. They are around. I know that they are here. So I'm walking out. Didn't see them walking in. I'm walking out and I see their booth by the exit. And I just pull out my phone and I start pretending to have a conversation. <laughs> I'm like, yep, I'm good. Yep, no, I'll have to get back to you on that. Look for an email in your inbox. And I walk right out the door. Nobody said a word to me. So for the next few months, every time I went to Metro Market, I was ready to pull out my phone and have a fake conversation with nobody so I didn't get bombarded about the satisfaction I have with my home internet. Now, when it comes to a spiritual topic around sharing our faith, sometimes we have experiences like that that come to mind, right? Because anytime somebody like uninvitedly enters into your life, it can be off-putting, especially when they're pushy and they're persistent and you're not okay with what's going on and then you add the topic of religion and it's like walls, just go up instantly. And when it comes to sharing our faith, we can be reluctant about that idea because situations where somebody's trying to sell us something in a kind of forceful way can come to mind. But one of the assumptions in the New Testament is that we are people who are called to share our faith with the world. Like that's just kind of like a, a, a regular assumption that the New Testament has. But for us, the question then surfaces, like, are we actually doing that? Like, are we actually seeking to share our faith with people? And then another question we have to ask is like, how effective are we if we are? Like, if the New Testament is assuming we do, and we're calling ourselves faithful followers of Jesus, like, are we actually sharing our faith? And if we are, how 
effective are we? Well, our passage today speaks to these two questions, speaks to Paul and how he shared his faith and how effective he was. And this is where our passage begins. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. So in this section of the letter, Paul is talking about the time he spent in person with the church in Thessalonica. And the reason why Paul was in Thessalonica in the first place, and the reason why Paul went anywhere that he did, did was for the purpose of sharing his faith with anybody he engaged with. And he's recalling here how effective and fruitful his time was with them. Meaning, it was effective in that people received what he was sharing. You can read the story of Paul's time in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. And in that story, we read that as he shared his faith, a large number of people received the faith that he had. A large number of people responded to what it is he was sharing. So much so that it put the city in an uproar. There was riots. There were mobs. People were dragged in front of the city officials. People were making charges against Paul that he's turning the city upside down. Not only this city, but everywhere that he goes, he's just causing a big stir. There's mass chaos, but in that chaos, people are saying, hmm, I want in on what that guy has. And so the question is, like, what made Paul so effective? Like, what gave him the boldness to continually share his faith, and what made him so effective? This is what we read in verse 2. He said, We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. So Paul makes his way to Thessalonica on his second missionary trip. Acts records that Paul took three missionary journeys all throughout the Roman Empire. Thessalonians was, uh, the Thessalonica was a, a stop on his second trip. And right before he came to Thessalonica, he spent time in Philippi, as he's referring to here. And in Philippi, he was beaten, he was flogged, and he was wrongfully imprisoned just for talking about what he believes. Now, you might think that Paul's thinking on the back end of just being like beaten to the edge of his life, when he leaves Philippi, he's like, we're going to Thessalonica, and what we're going to do there is we're going to rest. We're going to recover. We're going to get our feet under us. We're going to lick our wounds, get regathered, and then we'll move on and go somewhere else. But what he says is, you know that we were treated outrageously in Philippi, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. He faced persecution in Philippi, eventually left, walked into Thessalonica and faced strong opposition, but kept sharing his faith. See, what makes Paul so effective is that he's compelled by his message. He's compelled by the message that he has, that message specifically being the gospel. He said, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Paul can't not share the gospel, even in the face of persecution, even when it will cost him. And the gospel in this passage is front and center of all throughout Paul's ministry. Specifically here, you see Paul use the word gospel four times. He uses it six times through the course of this whole letter, and he uses it four times right here. And the way that Paul and the New Testament understand the gospel is that it's a declaration. It's a proclamation of something that has happened something that has been completed. It's an announcement that something is done. Therefore, you could say it's a proclamation of news. The Bible calls it good news. It's good news for those who receive it. God has done something without our contribution to that thing to complete a good work that's good news for us. Um, I wonder if in 
the last recent years, somebody has, people here have maybe sold a home. Anybody sold a home recently? Maybe in 2021 you sold a home. Anybody who has sold a house in the last couple years has received good news because what has probably happened for you is you have received the news that your house value has gone up exponentially. I had a friend who sold their house in 2021 and he bought it in 2016, five years earlier. They sold it for $100,000 more than what they bought it for five years earlier. And it was just a modest home. It's like a 1,300 square foot home. But the value jumped up exponentially. When they put that for sale sign in their yard, they received good news that value had been added to their life without them having to do anything to just receive that news. For the gospel, similarly, there's good news for you. That there is great value for you and who God is and what he has done. And it's something that has been secured for you. Nothing that you have to do, but it is done for you. All you have to do is receive that news. Now, even though Paul uses the term gospel four times in this passage, he's simply mentioning it more than he is proclaiming it. Meaning, in our passage, it's more of a mention of the gospel rather than him explaining it or declaring it or trying to demonstrate what it is. But there is one place specifically in chapter 1 where Paul gives a declaration of the gospel. It comes at the end of chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Part of what Paul's doing in chapter 1 is he's writing to the church in Thessalonica saying that as I travel everywhere, people are telling me about what happened when I was in Thessalonica. Somehow the news about you and your response to my message is getting to places where I'm going before I can even arrive. I try to tell them, hey, you should hear what happened in Thessalonica. And they say, we already know. And they tell us what happened. And then he goes on to say this. So this is chapter 1, verse 9. It says, they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then in this quick stretch, he gives a quick declaration of the gospel. He says this in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. There it is. The gospel is the good news that Jesus has come back from the dead. Anytime somebody tells you the gospel and they end the gospel with Jesus died for your sins, that's only partial of the message, maybe half of the message, because if Jesus did not raise from the dead, he is a dead Messiah, and a dead Messiah is a failed Messiah and can provide no salvation for anyone. But he is a guy who's beaten death. He is the true king, the true Lord of the universe, and the way that we know that is he has beaten death, he has defeated death, he has come back from the grave, and now he's ruling and reigning over all things. And so what the gospel tells us is that death reigns in our world. Like, it's not very hard to look out into the world and be like, yes, it seems as though death reigns. And the reason death is everywhere is because there's sin in the world. The Bible tells us, right, the wages of sin is death. Death is the result of sin in the world. And if we're honest with ourselves... We're all people who have contributed to the breakdown of this world. Essentially, we've all contributed to the death of this world through our sin and our wrongdoing. The good news of the gospel is that the curse of death via the resurrection has been reversed. And so therefore, death doesn't have the last word. Even though we will all face physical death, spiritual death is reversed Because of Jesus' death, because of his resurrection, he's ushering in new life, new creation. He's changing reality as we know it. And we are people who can take hold of that. It's good news. And he goes on to say, not only that, not only has Jesus been raised from the dead, but he rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, sometimes when we think of this coming wrath that the Bible talks about, we might envision something like Jesus showing up at the end of time, looking like Rambo, 
strapping on a headband with a flamethrower who's just going to mow down everybody who doesn't believe. Like Jesus is really excited to decimate the earth with fire and show how angry God is at everybody who didn't believe, right? Sometimes we picture wrath in that sense. But what's interesting is that Paul, who wrote 1 Thessalonians, talks about wrath in Romans 1. And the way that he talks about wrath in Romans 1 is simply that God gives us over to the things that we want. This coming wrath, you could say, is just simply the natural outcome of our own self-destructive choices. I can hear pages turning. Like people are, are, are going to check. Is that really what he says? Yes. Romans 1. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed. And it's simply God giving us over to our own lusts. It's God giving us over to our own pride. It's God giving us over to our own anger, like saying, if, that, if that's the way you want to live, then you can have that choice. If you want to reject me because you think that life will be better, at some point he's going to say, I will let you have it. You can think of it in this way. You could think of it in terms of an addict who is chasing their addiction, believing and hoping that their next fix will fully, ultimately satisfy them. Have you seen these pictures of people who are addicted to heroin or crack, and you have like the before picture and the after picture? I mean, it's ridiculously sad and just like heartbreaking. Like, oh, their eyes are sunken in, their skin is all a mess, they're disheveled, their, their teeth are missing. You're just like, what has happened to you? They've followed their own destructive choices. This coming wrath is saying, like, if, that, if that's the life you want to live, okay. The good news of the gospel is there's another way to live. The good news of the gospel is there's another life that doesn't end in death. There's another life that saves you from your own self-destruction. If you would open your eyes, open your heart, and say yes to Jesus, he will satisfy the desires of your heart more than you could ever imagine. Paul is compelled by this message that death doesn't win, that there's a reverse of death, that true life, the life that is truly life is available to us and we don't wait for it for the other side of life. We take hold of it in the here and now. And he's saying, I have to tell everybody this news because it has changed my life completely. He is compelled by the good news of the gospel that Jesus has come back from the dead He's ushered in a completely new reality, and we take hold of it now. But the other reason why Paul is effective isn't just because he's compelled by the gospel, but it's also that he's not in it for himself. Meaning, he's not trying to gain anything, make a name for himself, achieve some status, receive some sort of benefit, his motives, he says, are pure. This is what he says in verse 2. For the appeal we make, right, this appeal specifically to embrace the good news, does not spring from error. He says, we know that Jesus raised from the dead. We have had a personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. Or impure motives. Paul's motivation is pure when it comes to him sharing the gospel. He can't not share the gospel. And it comes from a place of pure motivations. Now, what's interesting about the way that Paul talks about his motives in this pastor, passage is he describes them more in negative terms, right? Did you catch that? He says, for the appeal we make does not spring from error, right? And then he goes on to say, or impure motives. That not that describes not from error, the word not also carries over to impure. Not from error, not from impure motives. Then he goes on to say, nor, again a negative word, nor are we trying to trick you. There'll be a string of knots that will still surface in the next couple of verses, but before that he makes one affirmative statement. And he says in verse 4, on the contrary, right? Contrary being the opposite. Not negative, but affirmative. He says, we speak as those approved by God. 
If you're somebody who writes in your Bible, circle that. Highlight that. Underline it. Approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Now that comment isn't so much about his motivation, but rather it's naming a reality of who he is in light of who God views him to be. That he is approved by God. And then he goes right back to his motives again, and again begins to list them using negatives. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. So when it comes to his motives, Paul speaks to this tension that many of us experience. It's the tension of striving for approval from others versus resting in the approval we already have from God. Anybody resonate with that? Anybody strive for the approval of others? Anybody here want other people to like them, to receive them? Like we all want to be known. We all want to be accepted. We all want people to think well of us. And when they don't, and we know it, it can feel like a living death. It can feel as though we just want to crawl in a hole and hide and emerge when we believe that they like us again. I experienced this uh, just last weekend. So like a week or so ago, the weather was beautiful all week, right? I was determined to get stuff done around my, my house, outside in my yard, because we had this beautiful week of 70 and 80 degrees. So the project I was working on was putting a gate in front of our driveway so that our dogs would be enclosed in our backyard. And so I'm like, I'm going to get this done. If I do it and do it this week, I can probably complete it. So Saturday, I started to prep everything. Saturday morning, I went to Lowe's to go buy these fence panels that I could put on posts and open them up with a gate and everything. And I get all my stuff. And I'm loading everything in my dad's truck. I borrowed his truck for the morning. And this lady comes up to me. She's like, excuse me, sir, can I talk to you for a minute? And I'm like, sure. I'm still loading stuff in my truck because I'm in a hurry. I got to get home. I got to make the most of the day and get get it all done before rain maybe comes. And she goes, I'm concerned about your dog. And I was like, oh, my dog was in the cab of the truck. She's like, it's hot and your dog could be suffering. And I was like, oh, excuse me? Now, in her defense, it was like a warmer week, right? I forgot to crack my windows. Um, In my defense, I was going in for what I thought was going to be like 10 minutes, but I saw a neighbor, and he was super chatty with me, and then I saw another pastor from the area and his wife, and they were super chatty with me. And so by the time I got back, you know, I was just like focused and ready to go. And she was like, you have been in there 30 minutes. I'm like, really? How do you know that? She sat in her car and timed how long I was in there with my dog in the car with the windows rolled up. I was like, Ew. And then she goes, you know, I have put you on notice. And I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Did you call somebody? Like, is there some, like, dog hotline number that you call and now I'm on notice? They have, like, a profile of me in their database. Watch out for this guy when he's at the Lowe's parking lot. And then she's like, Just so you know, it's not illegal to smash somebody's car window if there is a dog inside in the state of Wisconsin. Like, as she's saying all of this, like, shame is coming over me. Like, I want to crawl under the car and just pray for her to go away, right? Why? Because I sometimes care too much about what people think of me. So, as the weekend rolls on, as I go into the next week, I'm thinking about this woman. There's some woman out there in the greater area of Milwaukee, who probably is cursing me. I never met her before, may never see her again, and I'm just like stewing over this. There's this like tape playing in my head of like, what a bad dog owner I am. I'm bad with pets, and she's going to come find me. Why? Because I care too much about what people think of me, right? And in the last few days, have like been crafting this defense in my head for why I've justified by what I did. But what the Bible calls that, when we think too much of what other people think of us, is it's idolatry. And that's what Paul is saying is great for what's happening in the church in Thessalonica. They're turning from idols. And the reality is anything can be an idol, right? A a good thing that becomes an ultimate thing in our life can be an idol. And the invitation of the gospel, when it comes to approval, It's to not be controlled 
by the approval of other people, but to rest in the approval that we already have from God. Paul says, we have been approved by God. Therefore, he goes on to say this in verse 5. So you know, we never used flattery. Not trying to dote on people, not trying to stroke their ego, to butter them up, to make them feel good so that they'll receive us. He said, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. We didn't have to pretend to be more spiritual than we really are to try and impress you. He says, God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people. Saying we don't need any external validation because we have been approved by God, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Now, when it comes to sharing our faith and this idea of not seeking approval from others surfaces, this mindset can develop where we think, well, we're just going to tell the truth. We're just going to tell the truth let the consequences fall as they may. We're not going to be worried about he, how people perceive us. We're just going to be truth tellers. That's a label that gets thrown around. Meaning we're just going to be truth tellers. We're going to just tell people you got sin in your life, that you better repent. The wrath of God is coming. And if you don't do this, you're going to spend eternity separated from him in hell. And then people feel good about themselves for doing that. Because they're like, we've been faithful to the gospel and we're just telling the truth, not caring what people think about us. Except that, as Paul talks about his work in sharing the gospel, being motivated not by what people think of him, but the approval he has from God, he has a very different tone in how he speaks to his faithfulness in sharing the gospel and uses a very unique metaphor. He says this in verse 7. He said, Instead, we were like young children among you. Some translations translate that as gentle. We were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. See, what makes Paul effective in sharing the gospel is that he's compelled by his message. He has pure motives. He, he's not trying to get anything from anybody. He's not trying to please people. He's resting in the approval he has from God. And he has this specific method that he uses that's based on relationship. He uses a relational method. Because notice what he says. We shared not only the gospel with you, but our lives as well. He's opening up his life to people to let them into him into his life so that they might see who he truly is. Then he goes on to say this in verse 9. He says, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, meaning you saw our lives up close and personal. You remember our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. I mean, we're not trying to mooch off people. We came into the city. We've got a side hustle that we work on so that we can support ourselves. We're not trying to gain anything from you. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God. How holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Then he says this, for you know. In the same way that Paul uses the term gospel four times, in this passage. He also uses the phrase, you know, four times in this passage. You know. You saw it up close and personal. And then when you add the you remember of verse 9 and the you were witnesses of verse 10, he gives six references to how the Thessalonica, the, those in Thessalonia saw his life up close and personal. They knew who he was in and out. It wasn't as though he had this public persona that was one way, but then in private behind closed doors, he operated another way. He was consistent all across the board. And then he revisits a metaphor that he's used all over the place in this passage. He says, you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom in glory. All throughout this passage, Paul is using family language 
to describe his relationship with the Thessalonians. He he repeatedly calls them brothers and sisters. He refers to them as siblings in the Lord. He uses the metaphor of a nursing mother caring for her child. And here he's saying as a father comforts and er encourages and urges his kids. Like that's how we were among you. you. You know, you have relationship with us and know how we live. So when I was in um, seminary, I had a professor, like everybody, everybody who was getting the degree that I had, had to take evangelism and discipleship classes. So the one professor that I had, like actually one of the best professors I had in all of seminary, because he lived this. Like he opened up his life. We would have classes at his home. It operated more like a small group. He went on a retreat with us. When he would speak in other places, he would invite us to travel with him so we could see his life consistently. He taught evangelism and discipleship. One of the things he required us to do in our evangelism class was to go share our faith with people. Like talk about getting graded on your spiritual performance. Like legitimately you had to go share the gospel 10 times in a semester with anybody and then you had to write a report on it. Like everybody was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we have to do this. But also an incredibly great exercise to go out and just share your faith. And so he didn't give you much parameters apart from that. And so the place I went was this college. It was a little community college in the wider Chicago suburbs. And I would just like repeatedly walk up to people and be like, hey, um, what are you doing? Um, you want to chat about Jesus? You know? Like, and like time after time, we would get rejected. Like it isn't a matter of like, did you know, are you like putting notches in your belt and bringing people to the Lord? He wanted you to experience how it was to actually share your faith. And the thing that I learned through that experience was what really makes a difference is relationship. I'm putting myself in their shoes. Anybody who walks up to me and says, hey, you want to talk about whatever? And be like, no, I'm busy. I got things to do, right? But if you have relationship with somebody and they see your life and they see the consistency of your life, And they're able to see that you actually believe what you say you believe. And you are seeking and striving to live that way. Then you have credibility with them for them to be curious and want to know more about why you believe what you believe. See, what Paul is after here, what Paul is trying to do here is he's showing that sharing the gospel effectively happens through relational authenticity. That when we have relationship with people and they can see our true authentic selves and they see the consistency in the way we live and what we say we believe, hopefully it starts to catch their attention to say like, ah, maybe there's something there in their life that I should consider. So here's my challenge to you this week. My challenge to you this week is who in your life can you share the gospel with? My, my challenge to you is, is not to just go right out of here today and do it. Maybe that's the case. But to start with identifying somebody. Identifying somebody in your life who might be a person who would be open to having a conversation with you. And maybe you can identify that person. And what you need to do first is just simply spend a season building a relationship with them. There's somebody in our neighborhood, there's a couple in our neighborhood that that my wife and I were actually talking about just this week to say, we should have them over to our house at some point. I should make them pizza because I make great pizza. It always breaks down walls with people, right? (laughs) And just to start to get to know them and hear their story. We see them walking dogs all the time. We have these passing conversations with them on the street. And so like, I've been thinking, I need to invite them into my space. The other thing I need to do is I need to start praying for them. Paul, Paul writes in Colossians, pray for me. He says that God might open a door for his message. So maybe it's praying that there's an open door, an open door to relationship and an open door to conversation. My challenge for you is to think of somebody in the days ahead. Who can I build relationship with? Who can I invite into my life so that they can experience the love that God has for me and hopefully it's flowing from me to them, and may they be touched by this good news that death doesn't win, that there's a better way to live, that the life that is truly worth living is available to us in the here and now. 
So are you sharing your faith and with whom? And may you find that as you do, as you step into this, it gives you courage and boldness to say, yes, this truly is the life that I want to live. So may you be compelled by the gospel. May you be compelled by it to share it with people in your life. May you trust that your approval is squarely with God and not other people. And may you authentically open your life to others so that they can see what Jesus has done for you and take hold of it for themselves. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for what you have done in our lives. We thank you so much for the good news of the gospel, that you have reversed the curse of death, that you have ushered in new reality, that that you have done something new, and it's taken hold of us. Lord, we confess that sometimes it's, it's easy to grow complacent in our faith. Sometimes it's easy to just say, yeah, 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 I, I know that's true. Sometimes the busyness of life seems to get in the way. And so, Lord, we're just asking you to cut through all that, to give us a sense of conviction, to help us be compelled by what you have done in our lives that we might experience the ability and the opportunity to share it with other people. So we just say thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've done. Pray this in your name. Amen.